Welcome to 217faith.church, designed to accommodate your busy schedule. Here we strive to enrich your Christian journey and foster a community that serves God and others more effectively. The word apathy is defined as a lack of feeling or interest, a complacency, you could say, even indifference. Doctors tell us that, that an apathetic behavior can come as a result of personal loss, grief, a sense of failure, or even falling short of the hopes and plans that we have. What sounds a lot like depression can indeed cause us to get our eyes off the prize and come to think that nothing matters. Come to believe that we will never make a difference and come to practice ungodly behaviors due to a lack of interest in the true purpose of God for our lives. Just before the events that will lead us to, to the crucifixion of Jesus, the gospel writer Matthew records three parables in Matthew 25. Indeed, I call them warnings that Jesus gives us, the church, which puts our intentional obedience of following him into a divine perspective. Today, we are going to cover the entire 25th chapter of Matthew, allowing for God's word to speak to us fully. And it is my sincere prayer today that we will hear the voice of God calling us to wait upon him, to trust in his will, and to serve others in his name, regardless of what we may want for ourselves what may be happening around us, or how long we perceive God is taking to answer our prayers. In the previous chapters, Jesus spends some considerable time speaking about his eventual return and the end days, something that I strongly believe we are quickly approaching. These are wonderful words that you find in chapter 24 as well. Yet as we move our narrative forward into chapter 25 for today, we come to the parable of the three virgins or all of the virgins, the parable of the talents and the eventually the parable of the sheep and goats. Maybe you recall some of these uh, stories uh, from your younger days in Sunday school, but today we want to dig deeper into their meaning and draw from it the truth of God's message and his ongoing call to Christian action from his faithful followers, that is, those who choose to follow Jesus. If you do not know Jesus, I encourage you to search our website and come to know him. There's a lot of teachings about who he is, what he's done for us. Surrender your life to him. Repent of your sins. And then I invite you to come back to this teaching. I say this because I believe that chapter 25 of Matthew is designed for the church, for those who claim to be followers of Jesus already. If you're not, some of these things may not make sense. Make Jesus your Savior. Come to this one. But if you do know him, either from very recently or for a long time now, this message is for us. It is a call to action out of spiritual apathy to wake us up from our slumber and indifference and ignite us into faithful action. Make no mistake about it. 
Many in the church have been suffering from apathetic behaviors for some time now, going all the way back to the time of Jesus. So it's nothing new. And so let's begin right there in Matthew 25, verse 1. Jesus speaking says, The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out and meet him. What is the meaning behind this, just this first few verses here? We must understand that in the culture of Jesus' day, the groom would arrive to, to a feast and eventually take his bride out into the bridal suite or a place that he had pre prepared for her for some time. His coming was anticipated by everyone and welcomed by the entire community, including, in this case, the, the virgins or the bridesmaids, as we might call them today. In this account, Jesus relates the coming of the groom to his own return for the church, of which he already made some deep comments about this, as I mentioned in chapter 24. I truly encourage you uh, to go and read through that later today. He comes to take us, the bride, the church, to take us to the bridal suite, which is a place that he has preparing for us in heaven. The gospel writer John catches this in John 14, 3, when Jesus proclaims, I go and prepare a place for you, and I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. Interestingly enough, the ministry of Jesus began at a wedding, the wedding at Canaan. We focus so much on the fact that he created the best wine out of water. This is his first recorded uh, uh, miracle, if you will. Yet, yeah, Isn't it wonderful that as a part of his community, Jesus went to be a part of the wedding, a part of the celebration feast, to illustrate to us a celebration that we will one day enjoy with him in eternity. That's how he begins his ministry. Did you know that our existence, while here is a temporary one, those 70, 80, 85 years for the average way right, that we live on this beautiful planet, is momentary when compared to the eternity that awaits us? As some of the virgins did, we must wait in anticipation, fully prepared for the coming of our Redeemer, our Groom. Now, right away, Jesus differentiates in, in what I like to call the, the two types of Christians that we have in our churches today. This is not meant to offend you, just to point it out. If it offends you, maybe it's time to do some soul, soul, uh, soul searching. First, we have the Christians in name only. Those who come and they sit in the services, perhaps only on major holidays, maybe even give their tithes from time to time, but cannot be bothered to, to lend a hand or to share their testimony. And if they do, it's, it's usually through donations or a third party. Never personal, never intentional, cannot be bothered with that. The other type of Christian is the servant leader that imitates the behaviors of Jesus. They seek to represent Christ in all that they do. We'll see more about this uh, towards the end of the chapter. Often, these servant Christians, servant leaders, are ridiculed, really shame for their commitment, even by some fellow believers. Oh, so-and-so is just a do-gooder. He's just trying to show off. She just wants attention. Yet they are the ones that are always ready and prepared to do their part according to God's will. Some of the virgins in this parable did not know exactly when the groom would come. Actually, the whole town, because it says he was delayed, right? And as such, they showed up, but five of them were not ready for the long run. They probably they didn't think they were going to need the lamps. They thought he'll come during the daylight. The other five were hopeful that he would come, but still brought oil just in case, in case they could be prepared and their waiting wouldn't be interrupted. And so when the groom does come at an unexpected hour, those who were ill-prepared and had to go off to buy additional resources missed the opportunity to enter into the celebration, as those who had a foreknowledge to be prepared. We have such a foreknowledge. We know the crisis coming. Think about your faith. How are you preparing for the second coming of Jesus? He is coming, no doubt about it. And while I may think it's soon, as previously mentioned, he could take another thousand years. What do I know? Nobody knows. 
But even so, how are we preparing ourselves? How will we choose to spend time daily in his word, seeking him in prayer, in the service of the needy and others, so that when our master does arrive, he can be proud of our service, invite us into the feast, and bless us for our readiness and resilience. There are some people that think they can simply wait it out, but it is their inaction, their, their apathy, they will be their undoing. Jesus illustrates as much by referring to the two groups as the wise or the foolish, right? Continuing in verse 7 of Matthew 25, it says, Then all those virgins rose and trimmed out their lamp, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil for your lamps, uh, because ours are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for, uh, for you and us, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourself. While they were gone, to buy and be busy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him into the marriage feast, and the door was shut behind him. Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And in verse 12, we read, But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Friends, we must always be ready in anticipation of the return of our Lord. Imagine that you're 12 years old and, and your parents let you know that, that sometime this week, we're going to take a family trip. We're going to go out to the beach and have a family time. Make sure that you're ready. Would you not immediately prepare a bag with a towel, a swimsuit, maybe get some sunblock, a couple of toys in there, maybe some snacks? Would you not be excited about this uh, in anticipation of this family trip? Well, maybe, I guess if you're 12 years old, you probably wouldn't be as excited. Uh, more than likely, your response would be, uh, okay, and then go about your day and forget everything, right? Uh, forget about this wonderful outing. Now, when the day does come at an unexpected time, and dad is loading up the car, and mom is rushing us out the door, and now you're not ready, you have no idea where your swimsuit is, what towel you can bring, where your toys, where everything is. Not that you would be left behind in this scenario, but it would certainly delay the departure, right? And maybe cut into uh, the time that you would have otherwise spent at the beach uh, enjoying it with your family. As adults, we must live in conscious awareness of the return of our Savior. We must do all that we can to not be foolish, but wise in our preparations. By the way, this is not meant to scare you, as I said earlier, but it should excite us. If the return of Jesus scares you, then you need to speak to him about that. This is a good thing. Trust me, it's not merely about just going to church or, or helping down at the local soup kitchen. Those are wonderful, faithful actions. But it is about our attitude of gratitude about the whole thing. What motivates us to serve, to help, or to not? Like that beach trip, believers must wait in anticipation and be ready to go today. Or do we say to ourselves, ah, I'm not worried. Mom will pack up my stuff. They won't leave me. Somebody else will remind me when it's time. This type of thinking removes our responsibility from God's call in our lives to be on watch, to be ready. Instead, we must study God's word, learning from the experiences of others. So that we, those that have come before us, rather than just putting it off to the last minute. We must guard uh, what, against what I call the sin of indifference, where we simply don't care enough about a thing. But in the end, our indifference will be our fault, our doing, not God's. God won't leave us behind. Literally, we're the ones causing it to ourselves. We must also look for a possible apostasy in our lives. This is a very nice word. It speaks of, of the abandonment or renunciation of, of a religious or even a political belief. You may be thinking, boy, I haven't renounced my faith. Yet our lukewarm attitude towards God and our lack of faithful action, our lack of preparation is worse than if we had walked away. Jesus warned the church, warned, uh, the church uh, in the book of Revelations in Laodicea. He says, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one of them. But because you are lukewarm, meaning in the middle, 
I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You know, the only place I want to feel or see lukewarm water is at the beach. I don't like cold things and too hot. I don't like it either. The King James Version of the Bible uses the word spew or vomit. As far as I can tell, this is the only place in the New Testament that this language, this imagery is used. When you vomit something, as gross as that sounds, it's because your body is rejecting something, right? Trying to rid itself of it. If we're not living out our faith in obedience and practical ways, we will be vomited and lost for all eternity. More on this in a moment. There's a real danger that many in the church will miss out on the return of Jesus. We are called to be the salt of the world, not only to bring, to bring the flavor of God's grace, but also to save a different, uh, different things. Why right? Salt can, can be used to save products from corruption and decay. Only the church, through faithful acts and obedience to God's purpose, can save the world. Can we preserve them as being the salt? For God so loved the world, yes, but he wants us to go and be his voice, his act of kindness, his grace and actions. We can, uh, who, who, can, who can estimate how much damage has been done by half-hearted Christians? The world looks to us and sees no difference. If we're the same as them, this is not what God calls us to be. As a result, we must heed these warnings and be ready, aside from our responsibility to share the gospel of Jesus with a lost world. There's nothing more important than being prepared for the return of our Lord. We will have no excuses. We will not be able to rely on the readiness of others. This is a personal commitment and act of faith. The body of Christ must take individually and as a community. It is a part of our obedience to the will of God. When we come to faith in Jesus, it wasn't a blanket permission or clearance for us to just go and continue to do whatever we wanted in our own lives. No, we have been set apart and must live for and honor our master and all that we do. The Lord expects us to get to work and to use the gifts that he gives us for his honor and glory. Those who choose not to or fail to do it in a proper way, to utilize those talents, are in danger of being cast out. This is what the scripture warns. Jesus once again continues this lesson with the parable of the talent. In Matthew 25, 16, we read, For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to the other two, and to another one to each according to their abilities. And then he went on his way. Verse 16, He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went and dug it in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Do you ever feel timid about telling others about Jesus, like you're shy? Where does that fear come from? Could it be that it is a tool that the enemy of this world uses to stop us from fulfilling the Great Commission? After all, the scriptures are clear that God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Make no mistake about it. There is, no, uh, there is, if you will, a real expectation on everyone who accepts the gift of Jesus upon the cross to go and tell others about this good news. It is not just for pastors or ministers or lay folks at your church. We are all a part of the priesthood of believers. Our sins are not only buried with Christ, but then we are also risen back to life with a clear task to go and tell others of the goodness and the grace and the love of God. In the verse from 2 Timothy 1.7 that we just read, we are told that God grants us a spirit of power. The word here refers to a miraculous power, meaning it could be an ability you did not possess before. Yet now it is a part of your spiritual abilities. It is the same word used everywhere else in the New Testament to refer to the mighty works that Jesus was performing during his ministry. 
Yes, the power that was at work in Jesus is the same power that God pours into the life of every willing believer. As a result, we must move in faith and in the courage of God. Indeed, it is not just a spirit of power, but also called a spirit of love. The word love here is more uh, is one of my favorite or my favorite love word in scriptures, and that is agape or sacrificial love. This is the same love that God showed for his creation in John 3.16. The same love that led him to give up his son so that we might be saved. The same godly love that helps us to think of others as greater than ourselves. It is the same love that we are granted. It is a giving and sacrificial love. Finally, it is a power of self-control or a sound mind. This refers, of course, to the way that we think based upon our salvation experience, based on the fact that of, of our redemption from our sins through Jesus Christ. It is a power to be clear, to be concise, to be effective. All of these are not self-developed, but they are God-inspired and Spirit-provided. They will only be a part of our lives as we choose to live a faith of action. What gifts or talents do you believe God has granted you? What have you done to identify what those may be and put them into practice? Are you putting them to work for the glory and honor of God? The master blesses us with his property, his gifts, his power, and expects us to get to work, to put them to work. And he will return one day and call us into account. In verse 20 of Matthew 25, Jesus continues. The servant who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, and I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me Two talents. Here I have made two more. In verse 23, his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. I hope that we're starting to see a pattern here, right? It is not about competition, but about putting to use what God gives to us individually. I don't have to be better or, or higher than somebody else. I have to be the best I can be, according to what God has given me. Then in verse 24, he also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scatter no seed. So I was afraid, timid, and went and hid your talent in the ground. Here is what's yours. Notice that the rewards and recognition are immediate. The master celebrates the two servants who were not afraid to get to work, who took what we can call a calculator risk to make sure that they multiply the gift that they were given to them. They were willing to go immediately and put those gifts to work in a way that benefited their master. The Lord, for the last 2,000 years or so, uh, through the Great Commission and the evangelizing work of the church, anticipated and expected that we would use His spiritual gifts upon our lives for His benefit, to literally save the world for Jesus. What have we done towards this goal? I do not mean to single anyone out or to scare you, but I hope that, this, that if you have not, that you would take a moment and think about what you can do from now on. No one can change the past. But if we are convicted of our lack of participation of a spiritual apathy, then what can you do starting today? We certainly do not want to find ourselves in the place of the last servant. In verse 26, we read, But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I scatter not then you ought to have at least invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with some interest. Then the master says, so take the talent from him and give it to the one who had 10 talents. 
For to everyone who has will be given more, and he who has and will be given in abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast this worthless servant into the art of darkness, in the place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This utter darkness mentioned here is the same word used to describe the darkness that fell upon the earth when Jesus died on the cross. It is a place of complete separation from God, a place of helplessness, despair, and confusion, a place of suffering, a place we could call hell itself, brought upon self-torture, doubt, and regret. Three things that can drive us into a deeper apathy while here on this earth. Why do you think the master calls the servant, this particular servant, wicked and slothful? After all, he, he was trying to protect the master's property, right? He, he knew that the master uh, cared dearly for what was his. The Greek meaning for the word wicked here is a strong representation of something perceived as evil, essential to a person's character and related to their morals. Wow. If we do not bother at least to try to share our faith, we might be labeled wicked and slothful, lacking that moral sense to go and do what's right with what God has given us. On the slothful meaning, you can imagine it means lazy or, or other translations put it. Uh, this is defined as an unwillingness to participate, avoiding responsibility. These are both intentional words that Jesus uses in this account meant to draw a connection to how we are dealing with the gift of salvation that we've been given and how we are putting it to work to draw others to Jesus to, for the benefit of his kingdom, right? Will we be labeled lazy and wicked? Certainly, if we do, we will not win any points with the boss. It seems that at the very least, doing the minimum would have been good enough. Yet, my friends, I worry that for a long time we have just been doing good enough, that we have been doing the minimum, and, and, and that can produce discontent in us. It can bring about more apathy as we justify minimal behavior for sufficient faithful action. Yet, what are ways that we can at least do the minimum in our churches and fellowships and still be faithful in the service of God and obedient to His calling to us? Certainly, supporting uh, your ministries that you're a part of financially and in prayer can be a productive thing. No, we are not asking you for donation. God takes care of this ministry. Uh, if you want to support us, that's fine, but that's not what we're asking you here. We point you to serve and to give to others. Maybe helping to drive folks to the Sunday service or the midweek Bible study can be seen as a bare minimum work that can produce blessed return. Okay, I'll take that. Helping to set up the fellowship hall so that others can enjoy it. That can be certainly a needed service, right? Friends, we are, we are not expected all expected to be Billy Graham, nor should we, that should be our goal. But never forget that it is our duty to share the love and grace of God. If you've experienced it, you have to share it. Even St. Stephen was chosen by the disciples to clean tables. And still, God used him in a mighty way. The first martyr of the Christian faith. God will be the one that will send folks our way so that we may, through our actions and words, minister to their hearts. Church. We must use what God grants us to multiply, to bless others, and for the benefit of God. If we don't, our gifts will be taken away and given to others. They are using them properly, and we may lose our place in the community, right? We may be separated, as we will see soon in the following scripture. Yet, as we are faithful with the letter we are given, that says the more, says God, and we are blessed so that we can go and bless even more people. There is a clear connection here of what Jesus addresses next when he speaks of the outcome of the wise servant versus the foolish ones, right? In verse 31, we read, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and there will be separated the people from one to the other as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep to his right, but the goats to the left. 
I deeply believe that this passage is describing the church. I alluded to this earlier. In the end, when Jesus returns, we will sit in judgment before him and will be separated into these two groups. Not just wise and fools, but sheep and lambs. The lambs were faithful and utilized those gifts to honor God. And the fools maybe showed up at a minimum, but did not participate. Were not fully engaged or ready for his return. Verse 34, then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who my father blesses, inherit the kingdom prepared for you since the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to see me. The namesake of this ministry, James 217, that's why we go with 217, faith.church. Reminds us that our faith must be practiced in faithful acts. We're going to continue this on our study through James uh, next week. No, not acts uh, that will save us, but acts that will show the indwelling love and grace and compassion and goodness of God in us. We must feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty, and welcome the strangers into our circles. Clothe the naked, visit the sick and those in prison. As we do these things. Do not do it because you might get some views on YouTube or be recognized on TikTok or whatever by others. If that's all you want, then you will have your reward. That's it. But do it as if you were serving God. In the humility of our service, it is where we find the acceptance of God. This is how we get to hear one day, just like the servants of the talent parables did, well done, good and faithful servant. Perhaps you are not capable, right, of physically doing some of these things. That can happen. Well, you can certainly pray for those in the fellowship. You can pray for us. That I will ask you to do. Please pray for the impact of this ministry. You can financially support the organizations uh, that you are a part of. Or if you want, as we mentioned, previously alluded to on our website under Faith in Action, there's, there's a dozen or so ministries that, that we like to, we enjoy supporting. We encourage you to support them directly to them. You don't have to send us anything. Remember, God sees all things. So do not merely fake the part, but be his hands and feet to the needy. Be his voice to the marginalized. Be his love to the castaway. On the fringes of society is where the Christian must be. Forget about politics and being right. Go and serve people in the name of Jesus. This is the only true religion. And so in verse 37, the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry? And feed you or thirsty and give you drink. And when did we see you as a stranger and, and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when do we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them in verse 40. Truly I say to you, as you did as to the one of these, the least of these, my brothers, you did it unto me. Then he will say to those on the left, depart from me. You cursed into an eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. The devil's downfall was his desire to be God. He thought he could be better than God. He actually believed that he could do things in a better way than God was doing. I believe that when Christians refuse to share their faith, to share their resources with the needy, to give of their entire selves in the service of God, what they're doing, what we are doing, if that's our thinking, is that we are refusing God's desire for us, His purpose for creating us, to love each other sacrificially, to hold each other up in mercy and grace. When we refuse to be this thing that God has called us to be, we will turn from the goodness of God and come to think that other people will do what is necessary or, or, or I'm too busy to do this or that. I'm too important. Be careful, friends. This type of thinking will bring about an eternal judgment from God prepared for, as we read, the devil and his followers. In verse 44, they also will answer saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty 
or strange or naked or sick and in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer to them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do to one of the least of these, you also did not do unto me. And these will go away into eternal punishment while the righteous into eternal life. The wise will proceed into the presence of God with no judgment. Jesus confirms this in John 5, 24. He says, whoever hears my words and believes him will not be judged, but will cross over from death into life. Yet the foolish servant will go to a place of separation and despair, both for eternity. And yet the choice is ours to make. The Christian faith is about others, not ourselves, period. Maybe we will think twice before driving by that person on the corner asking for help. Or the homeless man sitting on the side of the road or lying down by the bus stop. Or the child stuck in an abusive family, but we do nothing to alleviate their situation. When we serve others in the name of Jesus, we are serving Jesus himself. When we don't, we are refusing to serve Jesus himself. If we serve us, we said earlier, simply to get noticed, then we have our reward. Others will recognize us. We will get the views. What a great guy. But that's it. That's as far as it will go. If our faithful service instead is in the hope of bringing God glory, we will receive his eternal reward and others will be divinely blessed along the way because of our obedience. This is truly the point of the entire chapter. We must get to work. We must use our God-given gifts to bless others. We must volunteer. We must share God's grace. We must tell our neighbors about it. The people behind us at the supermarket, the waitress that comes and takes our order, pray for her or for him. Spiritual apathy is a real thing. A loss of interest in our faith in the purpose of God is not simply uh, something to be concerned about, but something to be actively working against. Spiritual inaction in our part will lead us to, to such a disconnect from the pure purpose of God, from His amazing desires to save all of humanity and our role in it. How will He do that? if not through the faithful work of his obedient children. We all struggle with our faith and our spiritual actions. I, I was dragging my feet getting this sermon together, and I, I understood the, uh, the irony of it. But praise God for his strength and power to bring it to all of us. It is up to the church, to us. This message is a warning, a clear warning of what will happen if we're not preparing for his return and if we do not use his gift for, to, to, in our lives to multiply and to reach the world that so desperately needs him. Suppose we do not do all that we can for all that we can as often as we can to draw them out of darkness into the wonderful light of God. If we don't, we will lose our hope and miss out on the eternal goodness of God. And worse, we will cause others to miss out because of our apathy and our indifference. This is not God's desire for us. We must guard our hearts against inactivity. We must be intentional in our service and get to work now to reach the last and the least and the lonely, the abandoned, the abused, the afflicted. There's a saying that says, there's two best times to share the love of Jesus with someone. One is 20 years ago. And the other one is today. How will you reactivate and ignite your passion for souls and get to work under the direction of God with the help of the Holy Spirit and by the power of Jesus on the cross? Make sure you pray about it first, right? What will motivate us to serve in whatever capacity we can? Don't be called a fool. Don't be caught unprepared. Don't be cast out from the master's presence for fear of engaging. Make sure that we are spending time in his word and in fellowship with other believers. You know, the choice is always ours. But what will we choose to do to get to work or to continue to think somebody else will do it? I hope you make the right choice today. Father, thank you that your word is full of accounts and lessons meant not to scare us, but to draw us closer to you, to lead us into an attitude of gratitude and service. 
Help us to lay aside our worries, our fears, our doubts, and trust in your power over us to accomplish your will. Grant us opportunities to tell others of your good news. Lead us to be prepared for your return, to be ready daily to go home with you if necessary. Teach us how to purposely use the talents that you've given us for your honor and glory, that we may multiply those gifts and draw more and more people to your presence. Help us to find ways to activate our faith and serve others in your name, to be your hands and feet, to be your voice of hope, to be your heart and grace to a world in desperate need. You are coming back. You are our groom. You have prepared a place for us and you're coming to take us home. You invite us to obey and to enjoy the feast that you will set for us. But you want us to get others to join, to bring them from darkness into your light of life. Grant us the opportunity to save all that we can every day of our lives through our faithful service of you. For we pray and ask these things indeed in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.
Even when we meet in glory, when we see face to face, endless skies, endless ocean, endless will be together. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, the precious Lamb of God, Messiah. We are truly grateful to have had you join us in this service, and we pray that you will be motivated to put your faith in God into action. Please visit our ministry website at 217faith.church. And as you watch us on YouTube or on Facebook or on X, even listen to us on Spotify podcasts, please help us to spread the word by liking, sharing, and clicking on those notifications below. It does wonders to get the word of God out. God's calling humbles us to preach his message of hope and love and invitation. And so please join us and together we can reach more who surely need God's welcoming word of grace today. Until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his face to you and grant you peace. Until next time, be assured that God loves you very much. He is faithful. He is loving. Remember, He calls us to action, to be His hands and feet, the voice of reason, the flavor of compassion. Through our faithful actions, others will be drawn unto Him for all eternity. Let's get to work beginning today. May God bless you.